What I'd like to explain in this video is how we move financial contracts and other sorts of contracts, um, other sorts of programs, to run in the context of a blockchain. And if you remember when we talked uh, about blockchain in general, this was the summary we had. What we have on a blockchain is, is a irrefutable record of transactions. So these are, once a transaction is on the chain, it must stay there, it will stay there, it can't be modified, it can't be removed. And the, the chain itself checks that, um, provides a whole lot of services. It allows us to be sure that, that um, when a, a, a UTXO is redeemed, it's, um, it's only redeemed by somebody who has the, um, who has the authority to, to redeem it, that the process of validation ensures the int integrity of the blockchain. But on the other hand, we, we learned that the chain is passive. So the chain is built up for transactions, but the, the, any transaction is created off chain and submitted to the chain. So there are things we'll have to think about off the chain as well as on the chain. Um, and in particular, we have wallets, which are the, the places where people keep uh, retain any assets that they have and we'll need to um as a contract will potentially transfer assets then we'll need to think about how um how those processes are mediated how that how we write contracts that work in this in this world and we have to think about incentivization we have to keep keep the chain alive keep the contract alive the particular context we're working in is the context of the Cardano blockchain. It has the ADA cryptocurrency, though Marlow could equally well be implemented on top of a blockchain like Ethereum, which is based on, on accounts. As I said, again, in the introduction on blockchain, what we have here is UTXO model. It's somewhat extended in a way that I'll explain um, I'll explain in a couple of videos time. But the model is this of, of assets flowing along what looks like a data flow graph. Assets flowing from one transaction to another. The black outputs are spent on becoming inputs of um, further transactions. I've been working on Marlowe for a number of years. First of all, when I was an academic at the University of Kent and I was provided with research funding by IOHK and one reason I was keen to work with IOHK was the fact that they make all their work open source so you can look on the IOHK repositories and you can find the source code for for Marlowe but also for all the other parts of, of the, um, the Cardano blockchain. So IOHK are open source about their code but also they're very keen for us to write papers and so there's been no tension between um, working with IOHK and um, freedom, free dissemination of information. Um, and I think the other the other feature that um, I, I think makes IOH, working with IOHK so interesting is that they've got a strong commitment to functional programming. So if you look at a typical contract on something like Ethereum, there will be some of the code will be written perhaps in Solidity, the on-chain code, but the off-chain code may well be written in something like JavaScript. Whereas what um, the way that the Cardano blockchain works is that everything is written in a variant of Haskell. Um, and let's look in a bit more detail about what the Cardano blockchain looks like. It's got um, it's got the settlement layer, which is the, the fundamental blockchain, the point at which assets are transferred, um, settlement, the um, assets are transferred from a UTXO to a, um, by spending that UTXO. The general purpose scripting language in the um, Cardano blockchain is called Plutus. And Plutus is really a, a um, is Haskell, which is compiled down to work on the, um, as a scripting language for Cardano. Now, what we've done is building on top of Plutus. Marlow, in fact, is, is a, a complex Plutus smart contract. We've built our, our special purpose domain specific language. 
And you, as you can see from the diagram, this is embedded in Haskell. So Haskell pervades the, the, the programming aspect of the Cardano blockchain. With general purpose facilities provided by Plutus and special purpose facilities by, by Marlow. And as you can see there, that I've also shown that we need to link the real world to Marlow, potentially through receiving it. Receiving in, receiving deposits or, or or getting information from the world about the price of a particular um, stock or of crude oil or whatever, but also it needs to be linked to um, to users' wallets so that um, assets can flow in and out of of um, running Marlow contracts. So that's the general picture that we have. That's where Marlow sits in the blockchain ecosystem. Now, what happens when we move things onto blockchain? Well, we have to think differently about how contracts are enforced. Um, a non-blockchain contract, in the end, is going to be enforced by a legal system. Um, the, the contract is not self-enforcing. But the world of blockchain, the world of distributed ledgers, is one where there may not be any authority to, in, to ensure that the contract is um, enforced. Now, you could say one one view of that is to say, oh, okay, that's fine. What we'll do is we'll the blockchain will be there to record transactions, to record what has happened. So it will it will provide an auditing, um, an automation facility, but it won't necessarily enforce um, that the contract, the conditions of the contract are adhered to. But we can also try to think about how we might use using um, crypto economics using the right set of incentives might be able to ensure that the contract is as self-enforcing as it can be so we need to, that's a new dimension we have to think about um, the, <laughs> the other the other intriguing thing about um, difference between the blockchain world and the financial world is is this question of double spend now of course we don't want you know, blockchain is is when for thinking about cryptocurrencies, we want cryptocurrencies to behave like real currencies in that money can't be spent twice. If I have a, a £10 note and I spend it, that note is spent. I can't then spend it again. But of course, in the financial system, banks do spend money repeatedly or any source of credit is effectively, in one sense, a double spend. It's um, it wait it. In principle, and this is what happens when there's a run on the bank, um, money has been spent, it's been lent to people multiply, and it, it's impossible to um, to pay back all that completely. So, and credit is is one of the, the the engines of the financial system. So, we need to be aware that if we want uh, to use the blockchain as the, the place where fun, of the, the site for financial transactions, we have to be aware that we can't we can't model things like credit on a on a blockchain. Any source of credit has to be external to the blockchain itself. In thinking about how contracts operate, we need to think about um, the modality of those operations. Um, now, a contract can make some things happen. A contract can make a payment happen because there is the contract contains um, can, the contract can can initiate that action. But of course, a contract can't force a participant to make a deposit. So there is a different modality. Some things can be pushed, as it were, payments. But other things we have to um, we have to wait for the contract has to wait for an external participant to make something happen um, and just in thinking about making sure that contracts behave as they should we have to think i talked a bit about this for the general blockchain um, but it applies equally well here we certainly want to avoid bad behavior we don't want to be able to spend money twice for example but we also have to make sure that good things keep on happening we'd want to we have to avoid a situation where participants can we have to try to avoid as much as we can the situation where participants withdraw from a contract they simply stop 
interacting with the contract. So we have to find ways of, of dealing with that. Um, so we, ha we have to think, um, we have to model, we have to get a sense about how we might get, um, get values from the outside world. Perhaps we need random values if, we're, if we, there's a degree of, of randomness in the contract, or we have to get values of oil stock prices or oil spot prices or stock prices or whatever. Um, now, it isn't in a sense up to the blockchain to, to provide those. And we can, as far as um, our model of how things work on the blockchain is concerned, we can simply think of these as a, an, another participant in the contract performing an action. They're, they're providing a value. Um, just like the human participant might make a choice, um, you know, this this um, this what we might call an oracle is doing something something very much like that. So the way we deal with this in the Marlo uh, in Marlo is to treat them as when we need to as participant. Now the other thing we need to think about, and this is perhaps at the, the core of what we're we're doing. We need to think about um, money being committed to a contract only for a finite time. So the money can't be can't be um, locked forever. And this is this is a gives us a way of avoiding somebody simply. Let's say, example: If I had a contract with you, you commit some money to the contract, and I simply walk away. In theory, that money could be locked up indefinitely. We need to our contracts need to ensure that that's the that can't happen. Um, so we need to think about timeouts. We need to our contracts need to talk about um, ensuring that after a, a given a, a clearly defined amount of amounts of time, um, money can be released. And as I, I said earlier, we can't require a deposit. We can only ask for a deposit. To asking, ask for someone to, to deposit a certain amount of money in the contract. Now, if we do that, we run the risk of having to wait forever. So we have to think about asking for a deposit, but only waiting a certain finite amount of time to do that, and then doing taking some remedial action if they haven't made a deposit by that time. So we, we use, in order to get urgency, in order to make sure the contract keeps on progressing, we ensure that every operation that waits for something from the outside world will only wait a given amount of time. And this means we can look at a Marlowe contract and we can see that it will have a something like an event horizon. After, after this amount of time, nothing more can happen in the contract. So we can see that at that point, where if nothing else will happen, we, we can quite happily, and this is part of our model, refund money, any money that's left, refund it to the people who deposited it. Okay, so I hope that gives you a general picture of how we approach moving to the blockchain world. What we'll do next is we'll look at our escrow contract and see how that has to be modified to fit in this new world.